بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا النبي ومرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد so last time we had started talking about the aura right so what do you remember of that conversation uh, about the different madhabs okay I guess the differences but when they align uh, as far as uh, what's the aura for men what's the aura for women so uh, you know between the navel and the knees okay good for uh, was it uh, the Hanafis uh, was it the Hanafis yeah they, they include the they, they include the knee the not not I don't think oh. the navel but it includes the, oh, the knee yeah oh, okay and for women Hanafis say that the feet are not outer. Good. And then all the other ones have to say that the feet are yeah. Forward. Yeah, yeah. And that that's like that's the most it gets a little bit more lenient, you know, um, with some early scholars on how what the woman actually needs to cover. And we had also spoken about some of the Madahib, they say that uh, the aura between between women or from a woman in front of a mahram is that we said is what essentially? Uh, essentially everything but the face. But, uh, no, no, like in front of other women, like a woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so. <laughs> ah, see, that's a, that's a, tr- that's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess in front of other women, it's, uh, it's from the navel to the knee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even in front of a maharim, and a lot of people, they have a problem with this, but I think it needs to be understood in context, yeah. right? So we said that there's a cultural context there too, mm-hmm. that uh, definitely applies to that. Um, so what happens if a person unintentionally shows something during the prayer? It, not it doesn't invalidate the prayer, right? The prayer is still valid. Um, what if he, or like, what if a woman intentionally takes off her hijab? Yeah, right, it'll invalidate the prayer. Or, you know, a guy takes off his pants. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine, you know, but the thing is you have to think about even in those situations, there's some mental instability that's, that's going on for someone, you know, to go to that extent or to go to that extreme. But, uh, you know, if some, a lot of times we have brothers that's just complaining like a woman's hair showed, you know, during the prayer or, yeah, man, you know, and then like, or, I mean, and the, the thing is, there are different ways of complaining. One is like accusatory, where you like accuse the person. <laughs> yeah, where you're like, oh, you know, your hair was showing, right? And then um, the, the other situation is such that where you're actually informing them and telling them like, hey, your hair was showing, you know, during the prayer or, you know, sometimes uh, a part of the shirt or lift up you know and you know i mean just to let somebody know because obviously if even though it's unintentional do you want it to happen again no no, no right you, it's you, you're trying to keep those areas covered and we should do the best we can to help each other to make sure those areas are covered so there definitely are levels of aura we said that the highest level of aura is in the in the prayer right um, where you have, there are certain expectations that Allah has from us, you know, when we pray. So there are certain uh, expectations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has from us when it comes to the prayer. And this, this is probably like the highest level. What, what do you think is that would be the level below this or after this? Uh, I guess, uh, is it uh, Okay, uh, tawaf. That I think that would fall under a bro- broader category of just be of just being in public, right? So when when a person, when a man or a woman is out in public, I think this would be the expectations for them would be a little bit less than they were if they were in prayer. Okay, uh, and we said for a man in public, what is the minimum that he needs to wear? Uh-huh, from the for the navel to the knee needs to be covered, and for a woman, in, in the in the madhab. Uh huh. Oh, whatever is included in the face, right? And in the hands, good, right? So that that's in the method that these two areas need to be covered at all times, and for men, those areas need to be covered in all times. And we said that there's there's a there's another layer on top of the shara'i layer, which is the what? Yeah, like there are more expectations. Uh, where the we said there's a shara'i expectation. Oh, you mean about the the shoulder for men? That's for prayer, huh? So. No, so there's a there are legal expectations, right? That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has from us, and then there are other expectations that we have too that we're expected to follow. What are those expectations? About Allah. Yep. 
cultural expectations right so it's it's not you know, a lot of people will say okay well this is what the sharia demands a part of fulfilling the sharia demands is also fulfilling cultural demands um, an example of that is <clears throat> is it permissible now to lead prayer in western clothing so if i wore like jeans and a t-shirt is that is that sharan in the sharia is that an acceptable way to lead yes. yeah it is right they mm -hmm. Is is that the best way to lead, depending on the congregation? No, right. So, if uh, we're if we're hanging out and we go we're outside and we're at Union Market, right? <laughs> and it's and it's time to pray. What what would your expectations be from me or someone else when it came time to prayer? Would you expect them to go and change? No, and you'd be completely comfortable with however they're praying. But coming to a masjid, you have all different types of people. Uh, you have people with different cultural backgrounds. And if they if they want to see the imam dressed in an Eastern dress, is that problematic? Yeah. Why? Why is it they not? Want they, want, they want to see, like when the imam leads, they want to see him in Eastern dress. Oh, is that a problem? Yeah. Um, I mean... They specifically want him to be dressed Eastern. Eastern. You're right. It has right. to be. It has no, no, Thobe on, no, no, Thobe is Eastern, right? So, Eastern. yeah, yeah. Oh, Eastern. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I think that is. It is a problem. Why do you Why do you feel it's an issue, or why do you feel it's a problem? Well, you know, because according to Sharia, we just need to bring it out as well. Okay. So having more expectations. Having more expectations is wrong. I don't know. I'm asking. Well, I think, I think being uh, uh, you know so picky about it mm -hmm. is wrong. Well, I, I mean, well, I don't, well, I don't think it's a problem. Yeah. I personally don't feel it's a problem. Um, and the reason for that is because essentially, are they asking for anything haram? No. No. Right. They're asking for something halal. They're not asking for something haram. And not just that. When you're when you're leading the prayer, leading the prayer is a service. It's a community service, right? Mm -hmm. So there are expectations that you have from the community in, in that. Um, similarly, we have expectations, for example, um, from the police, right? So in, in terms of uniform, why do police wear a uniform? To be, uh, to be identified, so we can recognize them, right? And when we know, like, you know, these people aren't, they're not trying to trick us in any way, shape, or form. And, and that's very important. Even combatants, right? They dress a certain way so that they, they can end up being recognized. And, and even <clears throat> there are some cultural expectations that are for a person who leads prayer. Mm. Now, you know, and I guess this is like a bit of a tangent conversation. How far can you push those expectations? Mm. So if I'm sitting in my office, yeah. can they expect me to dress Eastern as the imam? The I'm just sitting in my office. I'm just hang out, I'm doing work. Doing some work. Why? But how come they can expect it when I'm praying, but they can't expect it when I'm in my office? I'm sorry. I guess this is this is your this is your private. It's my personal space. Like, I mean, I, I sit down. I people have consultations with me. People have discussions with me. What do you think? You know, personally, uh, I don't think it's possible. I guess it depends on the community. Okay. Oh, you're right. So every community has different expectations. That, yeah. That's definitely part of it. Uh, some communities have the expectations from like the archetypal imam. Yeah. Like, so for a lot of communities, the imam is somebody who, uh, who always dresses Easter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he might not play sports. <laughs> really? Really? I mean, it's just, just weird expectations that they have. You know, they, they always want to see him in a certain light. They don't want to see like his, his human side so much. That's a it, that is a problem and i feel i feel in those circles it's an issue it's a problem because that doesn't affect them personally like the prayer if i'm constantly thinking about what the imam's wearing during my salah I think that's it no no i'm saying and i can remove that problem by dressing right so i can i can just if i put on a thobe i've removed that person's doubts and I, his prayer he's is more sound should i not facilitate that Okay, so they're concerned that their prayer sounds. No, I'm concerned. I'm concerned because I'm leading. As the imam. As the imam, I don't want people. I don't want people behind me to be worried about anything other than the prayer. And if I can minimize those worries, 
I can't remove everyone's worries, right? That's not possible. Okay. But I can at least try to minimize it on my end. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah. yeah. But outside of the prayer, khalas, man. As long as it doesn't affect them personally, I don't. I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. So we had said there are two levels of aura, right? We said there is one in the prayer. We said then the one after that, or less than that, would be in public. What? What else? What would be the the next layer after this? In All right, in private. But what if they're? I mean, what if? Uh, with my spouse, is there a level between spouse and public, or no? A level between spouse and public, family. With family, okay. Any any family in particular, or it doesn't yeah. matter. Even cousins. Mm, well, mm, you're ah uh, right. So there you have you have mahram issues now. So that would still be considered public, right? So if you had non mahram family. Non -mahram. Right, there would still be public. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, there is a sense of uh, you. Basically, our guard is less when we're with family, right? Even if they're not mahram to us, like you know, whether they be cousins or whether they be uh, like your uncle's wife, for example, the nature of that relationship is going to be different than a complete stranger. So mahram, is like or mahram, ma mahram, these are blood relatives or uh, relatives through feet through breastfeeding that you are not allowed to marry yeah right in in in, in uh, here you're not allowed to marry indefinitely because there are situations where you're not allowed to marry someone but that person isn't your mahram like for example well, when you're married to your wife you're not allowed to marry her sister at the same time like, but if you divorce her then you're it is allowed to marry her sister so just because there's a because there's a restriction there that doesn't allow Mahramiya, it doesn't allow. Yeah. Yeah. No, cousins, cousins are not Mahram too. Why? Because you, because you can marry them. Because you can marry them. Like Islamically, there's no problem, right? You, you can, you can marry your first cousin, second cousins. It's not an issue. They like, who are people you can't marry. Immediate family, like who? No, I think it's it's important to define it, huh? The siblings, absolutely. Oh, good, good. So basically, it's your family tree. Anyone who is above your family tree, like who goes up from your parents, then who would that include? That would include your parents, their siblings, and your grandparents. Right, so none of these people can be married, and anyone who and any of their from your parents because your parents are the bottleneck, mm -hmm. and any of their children mm -hmm. going down. Mm -hmm. Stepchildren, no, uh, they can actually marry. Yeah, so half half siblings can't marry. Step children, step siblings can. So what is a step sibling? For example, you have a brother with a daughter and a sister with a son before they're married and a sister with a son and then those two people marry they mm -hmm. what about their kids can their kids marry oh, they, can. they can why because there's no relationship there's no blood relationship there it's a unique scenario it's a unique situation but but shut on technically they can marry no, that's that's not that's not an issue um but uh, so basically that bottleneck is at your parents and then it goes down from there, meaning that you, uh, you can't marry any of your siblings and you can't marry any of your nieces and nephews. All of these people are considered mahram. And through, uh, through breastfeeding. So if, um, if your daughter is fed by someone, you know, for example, then her and her children and her husband and like anyone related to her would be cons would be considered mahram for your your daughter or your son. Anyone connected to her. So so for example, my my daughter was was fed by one of my friend's wives, and so now she has she has a mahram in Egypt. Like so so like her basically her milk mother's brothers would be all mahram to her, and her parents. And her children, not her nieces and nephews, but her children. Yeah. 
it's a, it's a interesting. Right. So the third level would be in front of the same gender, right? So it, or you, <clears throat> I, this I would caveat a little bit. So I think I would put in front of Maharam and then in front of the same gender because in front of a Maharam and in front of the same gender, who would you be a little bit more comfortable around? In, in versus the same gender? You'd be more comfortable in front of the same gender, right? And <clears throat> you ha usually have cultures that, that dictate that. This is why you have you know, men and women locker rooms, right? Versus, um, you know, mahram <laughs> locker locker rooms, <laughs> right? Now, and the reason there's a reason for that. Even in even in people who live in the same home, like you know, the sons and daughters will always have separate spaces to to change, um, it, like because those things have to be uh, they have to be recognized. And it, even culturally, it's considered more appropriate that sisters share rooms versus you know you have one brother if you have, if i have four kids for example if i have if i have if i put my a son and daughter in a room and a son and daughter in another room it's considered awkward right it's considered culturally strange uh shout out to my it's fine you know this is not an issue but uh in order to avoid potential issues and potential problems it's always good to keep the same gender together type so in front of the same gender what what are the limitations men and women Right, it's navel to the knee, and not just that. It's actually it's it's a little looser than that. Uh, why? Because you have narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu actually exposing his thighs, you know, um, in public to to some of the companions. So, what is the area that you absolutely can't show? It would be the the private areas, right? So, front and back. Right? These places, these areas are not permissible to share. Uh, so, I, I should switch these, right? Should put mahram first and then gender and then after that is in front of the spouse so in front of the spouse in general there's no uh, there's no <laughs> uh, for Uthman. Uthman, he's, he's going to share the delil I should, I should ask his wife how much she covers in front of him <laughs> The what? <laughs> breastfeeding. Uh, breastfeeding. Allah mustad. Allah mustad. So I, uh, you know, what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that at another time. It was ter <laughs> terrible, terrible fatwa. <laughs> which, which actually leads us to our next discussion, which is gender interaction, which I think is something that's really important, right? And uh, I know it's not directly related to the salah, but how, how should men and women kind of deal with each other? Um, and is it permissible for men to look at women and women to look at men? You you do have khilaf, right? You do have a difference of opinion on if if I'm looking at a woman without lust, if I'm looking at a woman without desire, the, the majority of scholars say that it is permissible to look at her. Mm. And, and what do I mean by that? And what are some situations if I'm at the store, right? Or I'm dealing with the salesman or I'm dealing with the superior, right? So sometimes we have teachers that are female. Sometimes we have uh, coworkers that are female. Um, when we go to the store, many of the service, people who provide services are female. So can, can I look at these people? Yeah, yeah absolutely, right? Like when, when does it become haram? When, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about lowering the gaze, when does that apply? Huh? When when you have those lustful feelings toward toward that person, or when you have that attraction, and who determines that? You do, you do right? You can determine that yourself, and it's not uh, that's not a big deal. It's not a problem. Uh, and it's the same thing would apply to you know whether it be mahram or whether it be non mahram. Like, is it possible even with people who you are mahram to, like to be attracted to your aunts, for example? Right? Is it legit? Like uh, logically, it's possible, right? I mean, it's it's another gender, right? <laughs> so it is it is possible. And what do you do in that situation? Right, you lower your case, you know, and you you have to make sure you control yourself, control your interactions, uh, and and don't use that as a means because you know, do people fall into fitna even between maharam? Yeah, absolutely, right. And it happens, and everyone needs to uh, make sure that they uh, that they control themselves. Like just because I'm not uh, I'm not attracted to a female. Let's say I have a waitress. I, I don't, who I'm not saying ugly. I'm just not attracted to her. Like what can I look at? What does respectful mean? I mean, even shut on. We have we have boundaries, right? 
Okay, so I let's let's say the neck, right? <laughs> neck up, right? From the from the neck up. So or hands and face, it's not a problem. It's not an issue, right? Um, that that's completely fine. You start looking in other places, you might start having problems, right? So it's it's very important to uh, to make sure that even even in situations where there is less lust or less desire, that we try to control ourselves. The the problem uh, we also have the the transgender issue. How do I deal with that? If I have um, if I have a man who identifies as a woman, do I lower my gaze or no? Uh, Listen, so I've not. I'm just saying some of, some of these operations are not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> like like when they've the, like the transition like some of the transition it's like there there's some of them are pretty convincing huh. um it's what i, I remember a brother a bro, uh, allah protect us i mean i was it's actually terrifying <laughs> it's it's terrifying how convincing some of these operations have become um so what do you do in that situation because you're you're you even sometimes you might know it's a man but just look like this is very superficial, right? When, when when we talk about things, what do I do? You lower your gaze, right? Same thing. Actually, same thing. I, I, you know, we don't we don't have control over our hearts. We don't have control over our desires. And it's important to make sure that we control our actions, right? And we make sure that we we stay away from situations that might lead us into into haram. And. Uh, and, you know, it's a scary discussion, and I understand that, and it's an uncomfortable discussion, but it's it's a reality that we we live in, and we have to deal with it. Um, so, you know, try to avoid those situations. But yeah, I mean, like there, uh, there are some operations that I was I was I was shocked. Like I was I was very it's like very convincing, very convincing. I was shocked. A lot protect us and our children. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, hey, listen, I, I, and you, with technology, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, like as as I'm saying, things are going to keep advancing, and and with with surgical procedure, you don't think they're going to get better? Yeah. It's only going to get better, right? It's not, it's not, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to get any worse. Like, you know, obviously the first few generations, like this is still experimental, but things get very advanced very quickly. And and we we like we always think we have this feeling in the back of our hearts and minds, like no, I could tell the difference, right? Right, like I could tell the difference. I mean, there will there will come a point where it'll become extremely challenging. Maybe you won't be able to. But like I said, may Allah protect us and our families. I mean, but so how did the scholars of old deal with those situations? They had something called a, like a muhannath. Muhannath can be one of two things. It can either be an effeminate man, depending on the reading and the context, or it can be, uh, you know, a cross dresser, or it can be somebody who actually has both both sexual organs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cross dressing is kind of a new thing. You know, what I mean, like we're having like a man who's extremely effeminate. You know, what I mean, like these these are not uh, people. People think like these are modern phenomena. No, they they've been there for a long time. This is nothing new. Um, and you know, how how do you deal with them? You just it, it's 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 I'm actually interested in readings and finding out like you know what would happen during salah time <laughs> you know where would these individuals pray um and what, what would you do with them because because at the end of the day like even in a masjid like we can't turn anyone away and and we don't know people's backgrounds we don't know what they've gone through um someone might have gone through a procedure you know male or female before before the, no i'm saying before they became muslim right so what do you what do you do in those situations yeah you know um Obviously, when it comes to certain rulings, um, you would still treat that person as their biological. When it comes to inheritance laws, for example, mm -hmm. like the the biological rules would supersede any type of you know physical manifestation. But you know you have marriage issues that'll come into play, um, prayer issues that come into play, um, you know inheritance, like I had mentioned, um, in, in prayer. One like can can that person lead the prayer? You know, I mean, like, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, complications when it comes to dealing with this issue. But, you know, these are just rhetorical questions. I, we don't, we haven't faced them, um, you know, yet. yet. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they're not coming, but uh, it's important to kind of mentally prepare ourselves for, for some of these issues and problems. Because uh, the thing is, 
uh, one issue that we really don't uh, discuss and talk about that I think is more damaging and more dangerous is is the fact that the number of people in the transgender community who do have mental health issues and, and I think dealing with the mental health issue is is it should be more of a forefront and more of a discussion point than the actual transgender issue in and of itself because people who suffer from like Klinefelter syndrome which is people who have both chromosomes and both sex organs it's like it's so minuscule it's so minuscule it's not you know what I mean and, and in those situations, the fuqaha, they've basically said, whichever characteristics are dominant in that situation, that is the one, that is the gender that's assigned. But that's actually a medical, you know what I mean? That there is a proper medical diagnosis for that versus, um, you know, the a lot of the transgender issues that we're facing today, which, is, which I believe is more of a mental health issue. Um, so we had we had talked about looking at the hands and face without uh, without desire. Uh, the the Shafis, this is Uthman. Uthman walks around with his head down. Sahih Uthman. Huh. All right. <laughs> he's still he's still on mute. My my mute my mute button. I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, okay. Maybe he doesn't want to answer the question. <laughs> uh, that, so. so the there's some of the chef yeah they say no you can't uh you can't look at all you gotta walk with your head down i'll lie ain't it's, it's, it's especially the the, the chef is who follow the, the opinion of me uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so we have to so harsh man i know they're called safi shafi salafi allah is that what it is allah allah, allah protect us from them all the Shafis except Egyptians because they follow the uh, <laughs> So, you know, like I said, you know, without desire. Now, now the next next stage is uh, if we understand that this is how we deal with gays, how do we deal with gays? G A Z E, huh? <laughs> oh, okay. Like, you know, when we're looking, but uh, even physical intimacy, touching, most of the scholars don't allow touching like between genders um there do you have certain situations where it is allowed so um if you there's intimate touching right there's types of touching too right there's platonic and intimate so platonic would be like a hug a tap on the back shaking hands uh intimate touching is only for spouses right this is not allowed for anyone this is this is agreed on there's a mat on this non-intimate touching you do have a number of disagreements on on how to deal with it so uh, non-intimate is within the gender it's okay um, for between maharim it's also okay right there, there's nothing uh, wrong with that those platonic touches um, the also um, between strangers this is where you start having a difference of opinion so basically if and it has to do with age why do you think it has to do with age so when they talk about elderly and youth what do they mean by elderly and what do they mean by youth like I'm elderly and you'd be youth, right, Miguel? <laughs> so where does this apply? What does it mean? Level of attractiveness. Ah, attractiveness. I mean, there's some, mashallah, man, some older sisters, Efi. <laughs> man, like, may Allah preserve them. <laughs> so is it attractiveness? Like there has to be another law bit, right? There has to be another uh, criteria. For what I've come across in the Shafi'iya books is the the the, the Madalla to Shahwa, ah, which is ascent. That's, ascent, no. ascent, right? So basically, it has to do with uh, with sexual desire, right? So if that desire is gone, right? If that desire wanes or that desire is gone, extremely weak, uh, then at that point, then that it is permissible for that old man or that old woman to interact with with somebody who's younger. And like I said, in a non-intimate way, um, I've had a number of uh, older women, non-Muslim women, when I've spoken at events, they're like, can I hug you? And like, before I can answer, they're already giving me a hug, you know? <laughs> so I don't, I don't jump away. No, I mean, you just brace for impact, you know? <laughs> like, there's nothing you can do. You're like, oh, thank you. You know what I mean? And, and you, you just, you just be nice about it. Um, you can, uh, you, you, you don't need to like go overboard with it. But just, you know, take the hug and, you know, yeah, yeah, basically, you know, uh, just like a pat on the back type thing. Or even in our culture, it's very common for the for the elderly to put their hand on your head out of, you know, 
uh, out of a show of mercy, you know, and care, it, you know, uh, <clears throat> we, you shouldn't like jump away like, ah, you're not model. <laughs> Just, it's okay. You know, those situations is completely fine. It's completely reasonable. There's no reason to go overboard in dealing, you know, with people. Around. And even when they're doing it, they're doing it out of love, right? They're not, they're not doing it out of, uh, you know, out of attraction. So you, you, between two elderly people also, um, you have some of the Hanafis who, who do allow it, who say it's okay. Uh, you know, so a lot of this revolves around fitna. Now, there is a modern discussion about shaking hands. So you have uh, some of the Mashaikh uh, who allow shaking hands. Um, the, the two leaders, I would say, in this are Yusuf Khardawi and Abdullah bin Bayah. Uh, and, and they say because of the Western context, and it can, be, it can come across as, uh, so what I'm looking for, a disrespectful, right, to not shake hands. They, they allow it. And, and they also say, you know, it's usually not done out of, uh, out of lust. The, the issue I have is like, okay, if I have to shake hands with like five women and I find one of them attractive, <laughs> is, she, is she the one I don't shake hands with? And will that come across as more disrespectful? <laughs> or, or, that's what, I mean, for me, I, yeah, I mean, for me, I don't, I usually don't like that. I, I don't, um, there are, there have been situations where I was caught off guard, you know, where I did, but Alhamdulillah in general, I avoid it. In general, I'm, I'm able to successfully avoid it where I don't have to shake hands with women. For those who do, I mean, whatever. You know, I'm not. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, it's just not for me. I I don't. It's it's very difficult for me to develop a consistent criteria. And if I can't be consistent in something, I try not to. I try not to do it. So conversation. Um, is it okay for, to talk to the opposite? gender yeah absolutely you know there's, there's nothing wrong with that and what, what is the condition at what point should i stop talking to her or huh or at what point should she stop talking to the guy or if at least if it's not and one what is the what is a good criteria for that just, just flirting right and how how do you determine flirting you could tell right <laughs> like you you know exactly when when you're you know when you're flirting with someone how the other person perceives it that's not what i'm talking about this is important to keep in mind i need to know when i'm flirting does that make sense i i need to make sure to control myself now whether the other person on the other side whether they take it as flirting or not that's their perception i can't i can't control that the only thing i can control and i need to make sure is that i'm not i'm not flirting does that make sense? Yeah. So no, I mean, so they're flirting in what sense? What is that? What do I mean by that? You have to make sure that you're not flirting with the person. Hey, being playful um, in certain contexts, I don't, I don't see a problem with that because I don't, I don't see a pathway to, to fitna mm -hmm. for that. And, and I think a lot of these conversations and the, the context you're talking about is a little bit different. I'm talking about casual conversation, okay. right? When I'm when I'm coming in, I see some sisters. What do I do? I give salam. How are you doing? How's everything? I can throw in a joke here and there. That's not a problem, right? That's not an issue. The a different context might be if I'm interested in a sister for marriage, right? Um, in in that situation, I, I think a little bit of playfulness, a little bit flirtatiousness is actually expected. Yeah. Why? And it's not just to it's not just to arouse the other person. That's not the purpose. The purpose behind it is to, to see that this person does have the ability, you know, to be, to be flirtatious. This person does have the ability to try to win my heart, right? That's, that's the purpose behind it. Um, there's a, uh, and, 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 you know, subhanAllah, it's so strange in this era and this day, how, how that's become okay, right? How that's become okay? <laughs> yeah, like, really? in, yeah, man. In the in the past, that's, that's like there's like very little tolerance, you know, for these things. That, and and I always, uh, I'm kind of jealous, you know, like, really? I, yeah, because I was like, man, like dating nowadays, it's so easy. Like when I was growing up, it was like totally haram. Like, and even if you did, you had they would send somebody with you, and you know, it was so it was like, so, like it was yeah, like, gosh, it, yeah, it was like so awkward, you know what I mean? And, and, and the thing is, subhanAllah, the, I've had a lot of brothers who have said to me and who've told me, like, I'm like, hey, like, so, okay, what's, what are you guys doing? How are you getting married? And, and going online is very common now. And, and I think that's reasonable. I think it's fine. You know, you need to take advantage of whatever outlet you can 
when you're going to get married. And uh, our population is limited anyway. But I encourage everyone to, to take the relationship offline. I think that's important. You know, try to take the relationship offline because when you are online, it's very easy to put up your best consistently. Uh, and taking the relationship offline, you actually get to interact with the person, see how they speak, their intonations, how they respond. And I think that's important. Uh, so when, when I'm talking about dating, I think making sure that it is public, that's vitally important. It's vitally important that you maintain this public. Uh, make sure, you know, you control the flirting, right? I, I think that's important. I, I know removing it is not a realistic expectation, but it needs to be, it needs to be very controlled. Um, and, and I think after that, it's, it's see where things go, put a timeline behind things, and then just kind of move forward. I think the problem a lot of youth have is their expectations are really high. Um, you know, they need to match 100% in every category, which is, um, it's a, little, it's a bit of a spoiled attitude. Uh, their sacrifice, marriage is, sacrifice is a definitely an integral part of marriage, and because we have our own shortcomings, not not because marriage itself is sacrificial, <laughs> but because we have our shortcomings, it's important for us to learn how to establish relationships and kind of meet in the middle. Um, and even the idea of like, they're like, oh, so you wouldn't send anyone with them. I was like, usually they send the most worthless one, right? <laughs> like like the, they'll send like the youngest brother or they'll send, you know, like somebody who actually has no ability to stop, you know, the couple if they do decide to go forward and do anything, you know, either he's going to be pressed by the father or the couple is going to intimidate the kid. And so, you know what I mean? So I'm like, you might as well just remove it and allow things to progress a little bit more naturally, but maintaining things, keeping things public is very important. Why? Because as soon as anybody's intention goes South, they have the ability to get up and leave. Or as soon as somebody crosses any types of boundaries, the other person who's uncomfortable can get up and leave and, and nobody can stop them. And, and I, so that's why I think it's really fundamental uh, to, to kind of have that dynamic there. But uh, yeah, man, it's uh, you got you guys have it easy. It was uh, it was it was it was hard back in the day. <laughs> it, wasn't too hard, though. it was it wasn't it wasn't but when like getting references and like you know what I mean, oh, really? you, yeah, but you had to you had to go through family. You had to otherwise like it, it was your your uh, your proposal is not going to be accepted. There are certain communities where it works, but those like where you don't need uh, a representative. But the problem in a lot of those communities is you'll find like the marriage and divorce rate extremely high. Like, you know, yeah, the marriage rate is high, but the divorce rate is just as high. So it's, you know, which leads to its own set of issues and its own set of problems. Okay, what's the next one? Uh, physical purity. Oh, this one's easy. <clears throat> so what things need to be clean? Uh, yourself, your clothes, and your, your... Uh, your body, your garments, and the place of prostration. Now, this is really important. So if there's um, if there's dog poop on the ground, and I put my sajada on top of it, can I pray there? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can absolutely. Right. So basically, the places where I touch cannot have the impurity on them, and my prayer would be valid. Uh, there's a there's actually an interesting example of this. Uh, so the if I if I have a dog skin that's been tanned. And I, I think Uthman, you can you can chime in on this. If dog skin has been tanned, it's permissible to pray on. You can pray on it because the najasa is like in the skin, not on top, not on top of it. But I can't wear it and pray because I have najasa on me on my garment. Ah, huh, Uthman, is there any any truth to that? I think the Shafi school, the dog skin and the pig skin tanned without tanned, it doesn't make it bahir. Uh, oh, so no, that, no, even even even, even even the lawhead wouldn't be pure. I have to check that. I okay. assume not, but I I vaguely remember okay. it. But I I think okay. I'm sure it's it's very strict that they don't accept. But I will check that. I'll get back to you, sir. Khalas, exactly. Okay. So you 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 do have you know particular and specific issues like that, but those are like really niche issues. You know, they're not. Uh, I don't I don't think most people face that problem face that problem <laughs> it was like the only thing i have to wear is my dog leather jacket <laughs> um, uh, no it wasn't it wasn't a thing man at all it was just it's a theoretical discussion so basically what happens is 
because the number of things that are haram in Islam are pretty limited, right? It's not like this huge number of things. They'd be like, okay, if a person had to interact with those things, how would he interact and how would he deal with them? So <clears throat> is is there a tolerance for najasa though? Like, yeah, yeah there, there still is. Um, so the, the Hanafis, they say that even if you have impurity on your clothing or on your body, as long as it's less than like, you know, the palm, if it's smaller than this amount, do you, it's okay. Uh, stains in your underwear, the Malikiyah, they said it's okay. It's not an issue, uh, not, not a problem. Um, and uh, if you find impurity on your clothing later, so the Hanbalis, they say, no, your prayer is invalid. You have to pray again. But uh, the majority, they'll say it's okay. Um, but if you find impurity on your clothing or on your garment while you're praying, you have to remove the impurity. This is there's a jamaat on this. There's a consensus on this. Even if it was unknowingly, Sheikh, I, I had the. Even if I unknowingly had the najasa, but I didn't know when, when I was praying. But I figured out after prayer. Now after prayer, I mean, the, I I'm with the I'm with the jamhur, yeah, on, on okay. this. Like yeah, you know, the, I mean, like. But the Hanabila say. No, they say if you if you if you you there's impurity on your clothes and you mm -hmm. forgot, was so late, and you prayed. Uh -huh. You have to uh -huh. go back and you have to you have to repeat your prayer, but the, <laughs> yeah 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 it's just it's so much to kalif. <laughs> the kalif is like yeah. extra. It's like it's just so extra, it be, because the reality is, yeah, he, for for me the whole argument boils down to, is, can I do istijmar in place of istinja by choice? And you have the the ability to do. Istinja? I have. I have water, I have water. And, I, and, okay. I have toilet, and I have toilet paper. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to use water. I'm going to use toilet paper. Do I have that choice, Sharan? Khilaf al-Awla. Yeah. But it's Awla, right? It's not about no. yani, it's, wa yeah. wajib or awjib. Sah no. Sah. So I can use dry toilet paper to clean myself. Like, when I use dry toilet paper to my cl clean myself, am I going to get all of the najasa off? Like, not, probably not. I can't. Yani, I, I'm saying realistically, it's not possible. It's dry. Ah. So if the, if there's a shari tolerance for that, how come we have such an intolerance? Mm, you have to ask Bahuti. <laughs> yeah, Bahuti. Oh, man. Bahuti is tough, bro. But that, that, that's a lot of the conversation boils down for me. Like, okay, if I have a choice to actually dry wipe, I know for sure I can't remove all the najasa. And if I know for sure I can't remove it all, then how can I expect others to to remove it a hundred percent? We have and we have so many narrations of the Prophet Islam making it easier on us after using the ever after using the bathroom, take some of the water from wudu and actually go like this and and, and sprinkle yourself. Why? You're not you're not rinsing anything off your clothes. The, the idea is like okay, those sprinkles will mix in with the if there is any urine splashback. If there is any splashback from the urine. This is, it'll cover it up, and it's not going to bother me during the prayer. Yeah, uh, the a boy, a baby boy urinating on you. I mean, there's there's just so many things in the Sharia that dictate that there is. It. It's not a huge allowance. I'm not saying like, okay, you know, just pray with najas on you, but we have to understand that there is a there is a allowance for it, and there is a tolerance for having najas on your clothing or on your place of prayer and these things, because the reality is like, can we get to a point where I find ma microscopic najas on something? I can, and Allah won't hold me accountable for that. You know, to try to remove it like a hundred percent, I think I think it's a ridiculous expectation. You know, if you come out, if you say like ninety percent, you know, it has to be clean. I'm okay. That that sounds very reasonable to me, and I think I think a vast majority of people are actually able and capable of doing that. So there are some player places of prayer that we're actually not allowed to pray in. And these come in different nusuls. Uh, these come in different texts and different hadith. Uh, from them, graveyards, bathhouses, bathrooms, camel stables, uh, the middle of the road, the garbage dump, and the slaughterhouses. What, what do you think about these places? How come they're not allowed here? You're right. Najasa is going to be one, right? You're going to, your exposure to Najasa. Death. Uh, dead, exposure to dead people. <laughs> Busy place. Right, huh? Busy, like so. These are places that are frequented. People are using them, and you're going to be a uh, hindrance to them. I agree. 
or you're going to be distracted in some way, shape, or form, right? The garbage dump, what is going to distract you? The smell. The, the, the smell, man. <laughs> the smell. And the same thing in the slaughterhouses, right? You know, the slaughterhouses, there's blood everywhere. There's, you know, pus, guts, you know, I mean, like all over the place. Uh, the graveyard, the reason for the graveyard is, is worship reasons, right? Is worship reasons that um, the Prophet ﷺ didn't want to make the graveyard a place that people stayed and prayed in. Like he didn't want to make that a place that people frequented so much. Yeah. But people still do it. And I mean, it is what it is, man. It is. Yeah, it's not permissible to pray in the graveyard. You have specific hadith that uh, talk about that. Uh, facing the Qibla, inshallah, we'll talk about this uh, next time. I'm kind of losing energy. And uh, energy. your, your energy is about to run out too. Hello. Is there, uh, I guess, but before we end, are there any, any questions? I have two, but I'll ask after the in-person people, inshallah. Taib, khalas, no problem. You have any questions? Yeah. If we don't have any questions, then we will end here. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I have two. Oh, it's Fadl. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Yeah, the first one is in the Hanbali Madhab. Do they consider alcohol dajas? Yes. So this is oh. the the jasa of alcohol is for the for all form of dajas. They think it's najas. Okay. 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 And I, uh, I I personally don't. There are a number of scholars that. Uh, that don't view it to be and I just I think I did I had done a quick bath on it before. Let me let me find it. Anyway, I'll I'll find it and I'll share it. Oh. No, let me For what happens with the with with with, with uh sanitizer and stuff like that? Is it umul mul balwa then that I mean it it uh it, it just won't well, it evaporates, right? Does it? Yes. I'll but at that the... more at that lahda latifa, my hand is already contaminated with najis najasa. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 what, but what do you? What are some of the ways of removing the jasa? Mm, by washing and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. The so, second. Yeah. So, the, so for the scholars who hold it to be najis, it would. It's actually all form of the madahib and including Ibn Hazm. Wow, that's strange. Actually, usually. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is strange. Which, but which is interesting. Yani he he went against Dawud al Lahiri. So there are a number of scholars who hold it najis and if yani najas the right? It's not. Okay. It's not. It's metaphorically najis. It's not. It's not. In and of itself. So you have uh, Dawud al Lahiri, Rabi al Rai, he was, who was Malik's teacher, Layth ibn Saad, who was Shafi's teacher, uh, Muzini, Shafi's student himself. He didn't see it to no. be najis, and and Shokani, which is a more of a modern day uh, Lahiri scholar. The the second question is the what about the massages that have the maqam, you know? So does that include in the in the graveyard according to the Hanabila or so so the thing is <clears throat> there's a difference between the salah being invalid okay. and, and the salah being imp impermissible. I, I don't know in the methab if the salah would be valid or not. I'd have to check. But Yajuz Yani to have uh, maqam and then in it create uh, you know like a masjid. Live masalan Imam Shafi's masjid. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I know there are a lot of masajid that have maqabir in them. So the thing is, yeah. is is it permissible? Allah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's permissible. But uh, and I, in I, the madhab. Yeah, in the, in the okay. madhab it's not permissible. La shak. Now okay. is it is it um, is a prayer invalidated or not? Has has a suad, right? That's the question. Uh, uh, is, is is the prayer valid or not? Because something can be mm. haram, but the prayer still be valid, right? So, so. But the the the, pro, the problem, I think, is is it the Hanbalis and the Shafis? And they they say al thawb al maqsub and the al ard maqsub. They say that the prayer is not valid, or is that just a Hanbali opinion? Uh, that's a Hanbali thing, Sheikh. And even uh, <laughs> that one, the water. You know they yeah. want to be. They want to create like so two yeah, so. If you have stolen water, <laughs> your wudu is invalid in the madhab. If you have stolen clothing, your prayer is invalid in the madhab. Stolen place. If you have a stolen, like if the place you're playing praying in is stolen, has been extorted, your prayer is invalid there too. So those are humbly power, bro. 
<laughs> Shafi 2.2. Shafi 2.2. <laughs> Good. Uh, any other questions? Yeah.